Okay, good morning everyone. So today I will be talking about overactive bladder and uh, I'll be going over the summary of the clinical framework for the diagnosis and treatment of OAB. I'll discuss the current evidence we have on the therapies available for OAB and I'll also go over some of the new developments coming down the line for treatment of OAB. We'll start with the definition of overactive bladder. Uh, the joint definition by SUSU and ICS is overactive bladder is the urinary urgency, usually accompanied by frequency and nocturia, with or without um, urge urinary incontinence in the absence of any other obvious pathologies. And often overactive bladder is divided into OAB wet and OAB dry, where OAB wet, um, there's episodes of incontinence, whereas with OAB dry, <coughs> there are not. This is um, pretty clear to us, but urgency is a sudden urge to um, pass urine, which is difficult to defer. Frequency is frequent urination during wake time hours. Nocturia has been defined as the interruption of sleep in order to avoid at least greater than one time during the night. And urge urinary contents is the involuntary loss of urine that is associated with urgency as opposed to stress urinary contents. The prevalence of OAB is quite high worldwide. In women, it's estimated to be about 9 to 43 percent. And notably, OAB wet is more common in women than it is in men. In men, the prevalence is slightly lower, about 7 to 27 percent. And in both men and women, the prevalence and severity of the symptoms tends to worsen with age. This is usually a chronic condition, and it has quite an impact on health-related quality of life. And patients with OAB have been shown to experience more anxiety and compression compared to healthy controls. It's thought that the pathophysiology of OAB is due to enhance um, excitatory mechanisms and reduce CNS central inhibition of smooth muscle contractions and there's also an overactivation of the afferent sensory nerves in the mixture center. In terms of treatment, the AUA and SUFU has a set of guidelines for physicians to navigate the many treatment options for OAB. As you can see, it's a rather convoluted pathway and we'll go through the uh, various lines of treatments during this talk. Because it's so confusing, they actually published a clinical care pathway that's directed at patients specifically to help them navigate uh, the various therapies in conjunction with their medical providers. This clinical care pathway also comes with an app that's for patients to, again, help them delineate between the different kinds of therapies that could be available to them. In terms of the workup for OAB, the guidelines have the three minimal investigations that are um, parts that every patient should have, so a good history and a physical exam, and at the very minimum, a urinalysis. And then depending on the um, physical exam and uh, history, additional investigations include a urine culture, avoiding diary, post void residual, and there's a number of questionnaires, such as the OAB symptom score, that can be used to evaluate the patient's symptoms. And the guidelines don't recommend cystoscopy, urodynamics, or a kidney bladder ultrasound routinely for all patients, but uh, in some complicated patients, this may be warranted. The treatment options for OAB are many. So we'll go through all of these, starting from conservative, just simply observation education to first line behavioral modifications, second line pharmacological therapies, third line slightly more invasive therapies, as well as some novel therapies that have been looked at in the literature. So we'll start with the first line therapies. Observation is a possible modality. It's important to note that OAB 
is not a disease process per se, as it is a constellation of symptoms that cause a lot of bother. Sometimes simply education can go a long way in terms of what exactly is normal bladder function, what should be expectations for normal versus abnormal frequency, and simply telling patients what's a normal fluid intake and what normal volumes to expect per void, um, as well as going through healthy bladder habits can often be helpful. And it's very important to manage expectations because most OAB treatments can significantly improve symptoms, but doesn't necessarily cure or eliminate them. And these symptoms may be in fact just normal um, and not pathological. And if patient wishes to pursue some sort of treatment, it's recommended to start with first-line behavioral modifications. So this can be lifestyle changes and dietary changes, practicing good bladder habits, such as time voiding, uh, as well as pelvic floor muscle therapy with or without uh, biofeedback. Lifestyle changes include fluid management, and that's the um, primarily avoidance of excessive fluids, primarily in the evening. And studies have shown there can be significant improvement with the fluid reduction of this 20-25%. And in many studies, it's been shown that dietary management uh, can also help with symptoms. There are a number of foods that are known to be uh, known to be possible bladder irritants, and these include caffeine, alcohol, carbonated drinks, acidic foods, and spicy foods. And uh, reducing those, uh, many patients find improvement in their symptoms. In addition, weight reduction um, is shown to, associate, shown to be associated with improvement. Um, obesity is an independent risk factor for OAB. Particularly in the elderly, bowel management can also help. Constipation is especially um, relevant in the elderly population, which is um, a big part of the OAB population as well. And finally, smoking has been associated with bothersome lower urinary tract symptoms, so cessation of smoking can also help with the symptomatology. In addition, um, <coughs> particularly um, in a urologist's office, um, discussion can include bladder training, and that's practicing time voiding, and this can be helped um, with uh, voiding diaries and slowly increasing the interval between voids. And um, they can be sent to physiotherapists for pelvic floor muscle exercises that can help suppress um, the urgency with rhythmic contractions. And because often patients find it difficult to do this on their own, for motivated patients going to a physiotherapist specializing in this uh, with biofeedback can assist with localization of the muscles. But notably, patients need to be quite motivated and there needs to be continuous effort in order to maintain improvement and the benefits from this. Finally, just general relaxation techniques and distraction techniques can also delay, help patients delay the urge to void. All these are sort of first-line therapies, and they can be combined with pharmacological therapies if they aren't working or not uh, getting the patient as much symptom improvement as they would like. So we will talk about those now. The mainstay of pharmacological therapy is anticholinergics, antimuscarinics, and there are quite a few on the market uh, that we use fairly often. So the main ones that we use are uh, oxybutynin, vitropran, there's a immediate release, extended release, and a transdermal form formulation of that, as well as Vesicare, Enablix, and Tobias on the market. <coughs> A relatively newer drug class are the beta-3 agonists. For a very long time, Mirobirgron or claiming Mirobetric was the only one that was available. But uh, in Asia now, there is a <coughs> second beta-3 agonist, uh, Vibegron, that's available and was created primarily to be the 
competitor of Mayor Begron because it was the only one on the market. I'm going to talk about the uh, studies for that. So anti muscarinics have been around for a while and they have there have been many trials on it. There are lots of them because it's been pretty clearly shown to improve OAB symptoms. So there's a certainly an improvement for OAB wet patients. So there's a decrease in incontinence episodes. And even though the mean change um, is about one episode per day or often about one pad per day, um, I think this is clinically significant for patients who um, have this as even a reduction of one can significantly improve the quality of their life. And in the systematic um, review, there is improvement in frequency, so um, a decrease in about one to two episodes per day, um, likewise with urgency. And although this uh, has been statistically significant for some patients, it may be less uh, clinically significant. The um, interesting was in this um, systematic uh, review, it was hard to delineate the relative improvement between the various antimuscarinics in terms of symptomatology. However, when looking at adverse effects, um, the adverse uh, effect profile is quite large. The most common side effect is dry mouth. So almost 30% of um, patients uh, had complaints of this. Um, moderate to severe dry mouth versus just 8% in the placebo groups. The second most common side effect was pruritus, about 15% um, in patients with the antimuscarinics versus 5% in the placebo. But there were none serious. There is a lot of literature on concern with use um, in the elderly population, concerned that anticholinergics could contribute to delirium and falls. And there's about 70% of individuals who actually discontinue the anti therapy within a year of initiation. And this may be due to inadequate efficacy or intolerable side effects. The study pulled together the different formulations of anti muscarinics and there was a very steep drop-off um, in terms of the uh, discontinuation. So at approximately 90 days or so, at three months, almost 50% of patients have actually discontinued the anticholinergic, most likely due to side effects. In terms of the formulations, for um, whatever reason, people taking the oxybutynin in extended release were about 30% likely compared to some of the other anti-muscarinics to discontinue early. And this was uh, compared to the oxygen immediate release as well. Perhaps with the pharmacokinetics, it has a similar effect on the bladder, but doesn't um, have as much of a bother in terms of the dry mouth whereas and other side effects. We'll talk about Meribagron next, which is the beta-3 agonist. It's been around long enough, so there's a couple of RCTs comparing it to placebo as well as comparing it to anti-muscarinics and it has a similar efficacy in terms of managing symptoms so a number of incontinence episodes as well as frequency, urgency and nocturia. Because of the mechanism of action being a beta-3 agonist they thought was perhaps it could cause uh, hypertension but in these studies there were no difference in uh, hypertensive events or uh, hypertension in general between compared to placebo or compared to other muscarinics. But notably, in terms of the side effect profile, there is significantly dry mouth with Meribegron compared to the anti-muscarinics. So it's been certainly been a good option for people who have side effects with the anti-muscarinics or an older population where you want to try to avoid those. As I was talking about earlier, Meribegron for a long time was the only beta-3 agonist on the market, and Vibegron has, uh, within the last year, been approved in Asia in the very least. And this is a study from last year, um, which is a randomized uh, phase 3 study looking at this in Europe. And it has a similar efficacy profile to Meribegron, again, 
improvement in urge and um, incontinence episodes versus placebo, and certainly in improvement in subjective quality of life as well. Uh, no adverse, serious adverse effects and no increased incidence of uh, hypertension, but um, notably there were some pretty significant um, GI side effects, mostly diarrhea and a little bit of dry mouth as well, even though that's not specifically the mechanism of it. It hasn't been approved yet, but given it's a phase three study, I think it's going to come our way shortly. Um, as you can see, with the, both the doses of the Vibragra on the 50 milligrams in the blue and 100 milligrams in the red, there are decreases in um, incontinence episodes, urgency, um, and nocturia episodes, and they are clinically significant. So the take-home points for the pharmacological therapies, um, they have anti and beta-3 agonists can have significant improvements in OAB symptoms and quality of life, but anti have a often intolerable side effect profile that can lead to early discontinuation. Um, beta-3 agonists have a more tolerable side effect profile, but at this current stage, um, they are not always covered by drug plans and they are quite a bit more expensive, especially in my bedroom right now. It's the only one. Now I'll talk about third-line therapies once pharmacological therapies are intolerable due to side effects or they don't give enough symptom um, relief as patients would like. We'll talk about botulinum toxin first. So um, this is a neurotoxin produced by Clostridium botulinum. There are multiple strains of it, but the one primarily that we use is botulinum A. What it does is inhibit smooth muscle um, contraction and thereby reduces afferent nerve activity and feedback to the nerve production center. Typically, this is injected into the detrusor sparing the trigrome, and it's done in small aliquots, usually about 100 or 200 units at multiple sites. Between different formulations, the units aren't interchangeable, but this is specifically for botulinum A, and this can be done uh, usually just under a local um, Local sedation does not need to be done under a general anesthetic, so it can be done in the office. As alluded to botulism, the main indication for this is OAB symptoms that are inadequately managed by just anticholinergic or really pharmacologic therapy. But contraindications include underlying muscular um, disorders, and because it carries with it a risk of urinary retention, especially in the beginning when forget doses, if the patient is unwilling or unable to perform CIC for a um, finite period of time, um, you'd worry about starting it on patients with uh, elevated um, baseline PBR avoidance function as they would be um, at higher risk of going into urinary retention, or if they have a constellation of other symptoms that may or may not be helped by um, uh, toxin, you would be more hesitant to start this on them. So in terms of the outcomes, um, it was very interesting that regardless of what they had tried before in terms of the number of different anti they tried or the reasons for discontinuation, whether it was due to side effects or ineffectiveness, um, with the botulism they had reduced episodes of um, urgency, frequency, and urge urinary incontinence. But as I had mentioned, um, the side effect profile um, does have about UTIs in about 15 to 25 percent in systematic reviews, which is really not insignificant. And in terms of urinary retention, uh, about 6 to 8 percent really of patients um, required urinary um, uh, clean instrument catheterization um, de novo, um, especially after the uh, initial trial. So if that's something the patient's unable or unwilling to do, um, that's something certainly to consider. And even after the dosage um, had been titrated well, um, there was still about a 2% chance of needing CIC. And the um, botulinum toxin that's in the purple and the blue, and there is a quite dramatic change compared to the placebo and yellow 
in terms of the number of um, urge incontinence episodes um, per day. So it works well, but um, there are certainly some potential side effects to contend for. And these symptoms had re um, received the botulism toxin and the results are at uh, 12 weeks, so they have some lasting effects. Next, we'll talk about percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. So how this is thought to work is it stimulates the afferent pathway from the L4 to S3 roots in the sacral nerve plexus. And within the plexus, um, it's thought that there are some oversensitized C fibers that lead to overactivation of the uh, mitrichin center. So overstimulating them can um, help overcome this over time. And basically, a acupuncture needle is put um, into the um, tibial nerve, about three, four centimeters above the medial malleolus. This is done in the office, and the needle is connected to a stimulator device at a constant frequency. And then the amplitude is increased as much as possible um, un until the patient can't tolerate it anymore. The goal is to get the large toe to curl, because that's one of the things the tibial nerve does. And it's quite an involved process. The induction phase is um, one weekly session for 12 weeks for about 30 minutes each. And then the most significant part is that um, it kind of doesn't end there. Uh, after the 12 week induction phase, uh, patients need to come into the office um, every about three to four weeks indefinitely in, in order to maintain the benefit from this. Um, indications for PTNS, again, are OAB symptoms that are, have been refractory to first and second line treatments. Um, contraindications for this is pacemakers or defibrillators <coughs> if you are applying voltage. Um, prone to excessive bleeding, so you are putting a needle in them. And then nerve damage that could either impact a nerve function or pelvic floor function you might have less effect with them, and it has not been studied in pregnancy. The outcomes of PTNS are typically um, quite good, at least in the first year. They say about 60 to 70 percent are responders, so they have improvements in their OAB symptom scores and um, bladder diary. And it's certainly not inferior to pulmonergics and bladder, better than placebo, but a lot of the follow-up data drops off after one year. There's almost none after three years because it's very difficult for patients to keep going to the office once every three to four weeks to to have this done. And in terms of comparison with um, anticholinergics, um, combination therapy has um, been uh, quite successful. So it's been, there's been two big studies, one with oxybutynin and one with sulturidine. And mm -hmm. with both, using the two therapies concurrently together gave a better reduction in bother symptom score than just one alone. Yes, there is. So the studies I had um, talked about here are all in comparison to placebo alone. There is a quite a big placebo effect. So uh, um, I put here that responders were about 60-70% of PTNS. The placebo group was almost 20%, but that's still significantly different. So um, moving on to adverse effects of PTNS. So no, no serious adverse effects. Minor um, adverse effects were most related to the delivery, so kind of transient pain or bleeding at the stimulation site, as well as some nonspecific complaints like headache, um, diarrhea, and um, calf cramps. We'll talk about sacral um, neuromodulation. And that works by a similar mechanism of action. So this one um, primarily targets the S3 nerve and, again, uh, moderates the feedback loop in the friction reflex. The process is a little bit more involved. There are two stages to this. The first stage is the um, testing stage, where the sacral lead, which with four electrodes, is um, a temporary lead is placed in. And the idea is to have all four electrodes on the time um, curving along the S3 nerve. And then patients go home with this for usually about a week or so and try various settings and see if that actually gives them um, any benefit in their symptoms. And usually it's recorded in a voiding diary. 
for patients who do have a positive response, um, and that's arbitrarily defined as greater than 50% of reduction in their symptom, um, are the ones that actually go on to have an implantation of the neurostimulator. Um, so they have a permanent lead put in, as well as the actual stimulator implanted into a subcutaneous pocket. There are a couple of brands for Interstim and Medtronic. Indications are uh, for um, sacral neuromodulation are similar, but um, can also include uh, fecal incontinence, and there are some studies in the for that, as well as non-obstructive urinary function. Primarily, contraindications for this are um, the potential or current needs for MRI. Uh, there are currently no devices on the market that are MRI safe. So for patients with MS, for example, or something that would um, require or potentially require MRIs in the future, this would not be a good option for the patients. Um, and also patients um, who are not very mobile and raised for, at risk for uh, pressure ulcers, probably also not a good idea given where the implant is could predispose them to developing um, pressure, so, uh, pressure sores. Is it's been shown to be similarly effective um, as with urinary incontinence. I think there's slightly less studies for it because it started more for um, urinary incontinence. That's what the initial approval in 1997 was for. But um, a lot of these patients actually have a little bit of both. And the studies I've seen, you can, yes. And for the outcomes, there was quite a remarkable um, decrease in incontinence episodes and certainly a change, line, change from baseline urinary frequency and urgency as well. Similarly, there was um, in the reviews about a reduction in one pad use per day, which I, I would argue is also clinically significant. And because these are implantable um, devices that are meant to be in there for long term, there's quite a bit more long term data and it's been around for 20 years. So with about five year follow ups, it maintains good long term efficacy. Unfortunately, there um, are also quite a bit of adverse effects. Um, in fact, about 30 percent in one year and 40 percent at five years require some sort of <coughs> surgical intervention for this. And a lot of this is related to lead migration, so decrease in efficacy when the electrodes aren't um, lying along the S3 nerve properly, or um, pain at the implant or generator site, and mostly um, kind of in the short term, within the one year, but infection or hematoma of the um, device requiring um, removal or of it. So not without, not without its complications, certainly. And looking at you know, the neuromodulation versus um, botulinum toxin, so there was a greater reduction in urgent condens episodes with the uh, botulinum toxin actually, and a greater likelihood of um, complete resolution of um, incontinence episodes. Um, but with the um, injections, there was a higher Balder score from it, and. Um, there was a certainly an increased risk of UTI events. Again, the, about the 30%, 25-30% the with the injections versus um, it was not really a side effect that was uh, mentioned for the neuromodulation. Also with the injections, there is a risk of transient catheterization versus this was not really an issue for the neuromodulation. So um, take home um, points for this with the um, botulinum and toxin or the PTNS or sacral neuromodulation both have quite um, good effects but it's a kind of a different population that you're looking at for the sacral neuromodulation it's not possible to do for patients who need MRI um, there's quite a bit more follow-up required for PTNS patients for SNS, it's almost no follow-up once they have their device in place, just kind of intermittent checkups. For the uh, um, botulism toxin, still every six months, um, every four to six months for repeat injections, but that's still quite less burdensome compared to the monthly three to four weekly follows for the PTNS. For patients where all of these 
have not worked or are not options for the various contraindications. Um, the guidelines talk about indwelling catheters or bladder augments or urine diversions for very severe refractory complications, but uh, complicated cases. But this is really um, last line. So I um, talked about this mostly, and I think um, in terms of efficacy, all have a um, all have been shown to have some effect. To mainly when discussing with patients, balancing the different kinds of um, complications that can come with these uh, treatments, as well as how motivated they are to keep coming into office or where they live and how easy it is for them to keep having this. Now we'll talk about some novel therapies that aren't necessarily available um, widely now, but may become in the near future. So there's a number of different people looking at ways to increase, improve neuromodulation, primarily um, for SNS looking at MRI safe devices. And a lot of the times um, re reasons for device malfunction is battery problems. So looking at rechargeable devices by induction versus the actual battery pack running out and having to replace it. And because the generator site is a source of comorbidity often, they're looking at remotely programmable modulation so the generator can be much smaller and much less bothersome. Because one of the primary difficulties with PTNS is the repeated office um, visits. They've looked at transcutaneous tibial nerve stimulations, so there's no actual acupuncture needle that goes in there, it's just all on the skin. And it didn't have great results replacing percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, but there are a number of trials um, looking at um, how it is in terms of maintaining the symptom improvement. And um, there is about a still a 70% um, 70 of patients did discontinue this less invasive version even after about three years or so, suggesting that it can increase the longevity of the benefits from the PTNS, but it's not a very good long, long-term solutions. Um, no adverse uh, effects reported with this, but certainly further studies needed in dosing. Almost all 10 of the trials had um, different amplitudes and different durations because it's something that's still pretty new. And so we talked about percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. They also looked at percutaneous saphenous, saphenous nerve stimulation. Um, very similar protocols for 30 minutes for about 12 weeks, three months. And they had similar um, reduction in symptoms with no adverse effects. Um, there can't think of too many reasons why you would use one nerve over the other, but again, it's another pathway that can be used. Something that's a little bit different is intravesical electrical stimulation um, using similar pathways as PTNS and SNS, except for it's done intravesically. And there was only one study that I could find on it, very small, and there was in there was improvement in subjective symptoms even at the three-month mark. Because it's an intravesical treatment, this had one UTI out of the 17 patients. Um, but this just came out last year, and this is the only group I could find that had looked at this as of yet. <coughs> Something else that was pretty interesting in the litter was capitalizing on optogenetics. So op opsins are kind of proteins that will change their structural conformation after um, being activated by a certain wavelength of light. And if their neurons are muscles, you can um, stimulate them to either contract or relax based on the specific wavelength. And because they can be attached specifically to target cells given the wavelength, there's a much less um, crossover, therefore presumably a lower side effect profile of this. And they've, a bunch of groups have looked at transfecting bladder smooth muscle cells with these options to see if they can control this. The problem is that 
Um, no one's really figured out how to maintain a long-term transfection of these optogenes through the bladder in mice, let alone humans. And they still haven't really figured out how to make a long-lasting bio-optogenetic implant as it would take quite a bit of power to create that amount of light to activate um, various things and the battery would run out. So that's a kind of technical side of it. But in mouse studies, um, they have certainly had success in depolarizing or hyperpolarizing uh, bladder smooth muscle cells. And they've done more studies in bladder pain and interstitial cystitis actually. And um, based on another one study, it's been able to weaken the pain response during bladder distension based on um, the wavelengths they're um, shooting towards the opsins in these mice. So again, something potentially for the future. Um, so a couple more things that are um, coming down the pipeline. For some people um, with the bottom uh, injections might be very uncomfortable or difficult for them to have the urethral injection. So there was one group who did a cadaver study looking at transvaginal injection of the trigone and um, bladder wall. And because of the cadaver study, they looked at um, histology afterwards and instead of injecting the toxin, they injected ink and it was able to get through the distrusion layer. So that's another way of performing these um, injections. Something that um, may is a little less out there is vaginal estrogen. So only small studies again, but looked at women with OAB symptoms um, using um, estrogen gel. And they did see improvement in OAB symptom scores. And this group actually did urodynamics as well. And there was certainly a increase in the maximum um, uh, bladder capacity as well as delay in the first desire to void, um, but normally no change in detrusor overactivity um, parameters. So depending on the specific symptom profile, that's certainly possible. Along this line, there um, some other groups have looked at the um, vaginal erbium laser. It's often used in gynae um, because it's uh, thought to improve blood flow in the region surrounding the vagina, so it promotes tissue reconstruction, so similar to estrogen. And um, this one study looked at um, this laser versus um, pharmacological therapy, and the had similar um, efficacy as the medications in terms of improvements with the OAB symptom scores, and they actually didn't see any adverse effects with using this laser. And the final um, thing that I found in the literature was various gene transfers. It's obviously quite a ways from humans, but there's various um, channels that help uh, modulate bladder contractility, such as the MAX-EK was the main one that I saw. And in a very pilot study, there was um, significant decrease in detrusor contractions. Whether it was clinically significant remains to be seen, and there were no um, adverse side effects with it. So um, I'll end with, there's obviously a plethora of different treatments for this because no one treatment um, is the end-all be-all for all patients. Really depends on what specifically their um, complaint profile is as well as perhaps if there are any contraindications to treatments or how easy it is to um, follow up. Um, but as it is, there's really no one treatment that works for everyone, and a lot of patients jump from one treatment to another, and all of these treatments, even though they help with symptoms, um, often do not eradicate symptoms um, completely. That's the importance of educating what is normal and what can be expected from these treatments. So um, with that, I will conclude this talk, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you.